Hello, you're listening to the podcast of Bay Ridge Christian Church. Each Sunday, our aim is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ from the text of the Bible and to catalyze the hearts of our hearers to love and gratitude towards God and all of His creation. We hope you enjoy this teaching, and we pray that you will be encouraged to trust in Jesus today. I also wanted to say thanks to the congregation. We're taking a week off this week from the series we've been going through, and uh, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. I know that uh, I've carried us through some a little bit more challenging topics. I'm, I'm requiring y'all to eat some meat and not drink milk. Uh, and the congregation has been very, very responsive. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, I, I mean that. Um, I was uh, years ago told when I discussed the kind of congregation that I wanted to be part of and lead. Uh, somebody who'd been involved with churches for a long time told me that you'll, you'll get like three people to come to that. No, nobody's going to be that interested in digging into the scripture and doing that. And I am really, really grateful uh, that this congregation wants to be challenged and fed and dig into the word of God. So thanks to you all. Uh, I deeply appreciate that. But this week, we're going to take a week off from our series on God's covenants And we are going to be looking at what I'm referring to as the God of generations. The God of generations. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. I'll be using the New International Version. A couple times I'll talk a little bit about some of the Hebrew words and stuff like that behind it, but we'll use the NIV. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Hear now the word of the living, everlasting God. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. If you've known me for any length of time, you know that one of the things that's important to me is this sense of long-term relationships and relationships that actually last across the generations. Uh, I'm blessed in having four kids that we are close to and also the the spouses uh, of our children. Uh, We love being with our kids and spending time. I loved being a dad when all of our kids were young. Uh, And now, of course, we've been blessed with nine grandchildren. And if you're around here much, you will see that they are a source of, number one, keeping me in shape as The little ones want me to carry them around and hold them, but it's a deep source of joy to be there and to watch them grow and to be part of that. But it's also a deep source of joy, and I love that I've had the privilege of seeing kids born who are now fully grown. Uh, Kids that I knew also from when I was young, and I was a young adult myself that are now adults and actually have kids, and some of those kids are now grown and seeing them step up and uh, off in college or having jobs here, some of them off in the military. It is a huge blessing and benefit. In fact, I I mentioned to other pastors some as I get to work with other pastors here locally, and they're usually shocked when I say that I've been an elder here for 26 years, and my time in the congregation back from when I was a mid goes back, of course, to 1980. And so when you look at 40 years, They're astounded by that, and I usually challenge them. There is deep joy and blessing in being planted in one place. Don't don't be quick to get up and run around. And so there's a blessing there. But if you pay attention to the news or you're out in our culture, you'll also know that there's a lot about generational conflict. We, We hear about generation gap. If you pay much attention in the news right now, you hear a lot about how the church is losing the next generation. And there have been a lot of concerns about the growth of what they call the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, and also the duns, the D-O-N-E-S, people who say, I grew up in the church, but I am done with it. I I don't want to be part of that anymore, or I just, I don't particularly believe any particular thing. And this is always a concern that we have to pay attention to. And so today I wanted us to step back because part of what's going on in God's covenant, we've noticed several times that there's these issues of families and this God always looking forward to the next generation. I, I want to ask this question of how do we pass the faith from one generation to the next? If you're sitting here this morning 
and you are a Christian, or you're even not a Christian, and you're just sitting here and you're listening to me talk about Christianity, this has only happened because for thousands of years the faith has been being passed down. The words that I just read from Deuteronomy, Moses spoke some 3,500 years ago almost, and yet they are still being read and discussed today. How does that happen? How do we get the faith from one generation to the next? Now, as I jump in, I do want to say real quickly, because sometimes the church has not been good about this, there are no ironclad guarantees, okay? You can be a very good parent and have a child that does not want to walk with God. You can be a very good local church and have some kids who decide they don't want to follow on in the faith. Uh, Any ideas in life that if you do this, you will get this, are simply false. Life does not work that way. We live in a fallen world, and there are all kinds of issues and difficulties. However, with that said, there are some key principles, and there are some things that make it much more likely that our children embrace the faith and walk after it. So that's what we want to talk about today. Now, the first stage in seeing the faith pass from one generation to the other, that that the... uh, Moses begins, the Spirit is speaking through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4. The first phase is that we are commanded to watch ourselves. Before you can be used to pass the faith on to another generation, whether your own kids or grandkids or just the next generation in the church, the first step is watching yourself. Notice at the beginning of verse 9, it has the phrase, as the NIV is translated, it, be careful and watch yourselves closely. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's the same word twice. It's the word shamar, which I actually mentioned, if you remember, that Adam was to, uh, to take care of the garden. And we spoke about the Lord bless you and keep you, or the Lord guard your life. This is the same word here. And we are being told to watch or keep or guard or take care of ourselves. And it says it twice. Be careful is that verb, shamar. And so is uh, watch uh, is the same verb again. It just repeats the verb. It's actually there twice. And, And not because God stutters, but because he's trying to say, pay attention. This is of prime importance. And the word that the NIV has translated yourselves is actually the word soul. So we're being told, watch, watch your soul, or take care, take care of your soul. And this is imperative because if you and I are going to be able to pass on the faith, we have to first carefully, closely, notice that word there, to watch yourself closely and to guard the state of your own soul. Now this is very, very important because we cannot approach our Christian faith simply out of a sense of duty. There are a lot of things that I, I've learned in my life, you know, having gone to the Naval Academy and then going on to the Marine Corps. There's a lot of things that I just learned and you just kind of did by duty. Whether you felt like it or not, it's your duty. I agreed to do it. We're going to do it. If you approach your faith that way, there's virtually no odds it will be caught by the next generation. It will will not be an attractive thing. And friends, it's an imperative thing for us to understand this. What we're being called to here is a passion for the gospel. This is not a hard thing. If I am recounting and reminding myself every day of the mercies of God towards me, a sinner, one who has fallen short, who does fall short every day, who will fall short tomorrow, and yet that God is faithful. Despite all of my unfaithfulness, he is faithful towards me. If I am rehearsing and proclaiming the gospel to myself day after day after day, it will turn my walk with God from being duty into delight. It will make it something that there is a passion, there is an excitement. This is not just going through the motions, there is an excitement here. And make no mistake, God is telling them up front, you you gotta be careful, you have gotta watch the state of your soul. Because we can easily, over time, uh, I became a Christian in 1978, so it's been 42 years now. When you've been doing something for 42 years, 
there is a tendency to not be nearly as excited about it as you were when you first started out. Okay? If, if we're all honest, that's the way things are. But it should not be that way in our walk with God. It need not be that way in our walk with God. It doesn't have to be that way in our walk with one another. Okay? We can have long lasting relationships that actually grow deeper over time. Uh, I've been married to Linda for 35 and a half years. My love for her is not less than it was 35 years ago. It is broader, it is deeper, it is greater than it ever has been. And my love for Jesus is not less than it was. 42 years ago, it's actually greater and deeper. I know him better than I did 42 years ago. So he begins by telling us that, but it's also, he's telling us to guard our own heart and to guard our own soul, because if we do not, there is the ever-present temptation to alter and shift the faith to line up with new desires and perspectives. If you and I give our soul to something else as primary, we will start to shift the faith that was handed down to us to line up with that new thing. You can watch this going on in the church all around us today uh, that this can easily happen. And it's imperative because the state of your soul determines the kind of person you are. It determines the kind of person I am. And what that does for us is that determines the way we see life. Uh, C.S. Lewis in uh, the children's book, the, the Magician's Nephew, part of the Chronicles of Narnia, a great book, he's got this phrase that's very important where a person, a, a person is not being able to see and hear things accurately and other people cannot understand. There's a beautiful song going on and all he hears is a lion roaring like it's going to eat him. And then the lion Aslan says, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. If you and I let our soul get shaped the wrong way, you can easily start seeing and believing things that are completely contrary to truth. And that is what will be passed on. So Moses begins here quite wisely with, watch yourself. And he tells us why we have to watch ourselves. Notice the next phrase in verse 9 is, be careful, watch yourselves closely, so that. So that, here's why you have to watch yourself closely. So that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Now remind yourself that this generation that Moses is speaking to have watched God's work out in the wilderness. They have eaten every day because God has provided manna from heaven. They have heard the word of God. They have seen the works of God. They had seen all of this come true. But God is warning them, if you do not guard it, you'll forget about it. And it'll slowly just slip away. And so he's warning them to not do that. And so I'm to guard my heart and my soul that I do not forget what it is I have heard from God and what I have experienced of God. And Scripture is full of examples of people who experience God's Word or experience God's work and then let it fade from their hearts and minds. In fact, the very people that... Moses is speaking to, this is exactly what had happened with their parents. They had all died in the wilderness because they quickly forgot who God was and what he did. Remember, Moses goes on the mountain, and they don't even make it 40 days. They, they are promised that they are going to the land. They had seen God extend mighty, miraculous, powerful hand in Egypt, and crossing the Red Sea, and he was caring for them out in the wilderness, and yet they said, we don't think God can help us do the promised land because they had forgotten what God had done. If you read the Gospels, how often do the disciples forget? I mean, constantly. You remember Jesus one time is saying, he, he tells them, beware the yeast, uh, the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the disciples are like, man, we forgot to get the bread. And Jesus is like, well, what are you guys talking about? 
do, do you remember when there were 5,000 people and we had nothing? And he, he rehearses it. And he says, and then there were 4,000 people and they had nothing and he rehearses it again. And he's like, you guys don't get it. That bread's not the problem. That's not what I'm talking about. If we need bread, I can make bread. I'm talking about the teaching of these guys. But see, the disciples constantly forgot. So it is a great danger. And if we're honest, you can run into people in your life that at one point, they are clear that God has spoken to them, God has been at work in their life, and then you talk to them later, and that's all faded from memory. And so the Scripture tells us, therefore, that we're not to forget, and the opposite of that, of course, is to remember. And this is a major command. We're just looking at verse 9 today, but if you flipped to verse 10, the very next word is remember. The day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, assemble the people, and, and Moses told them to do this so that you can teach the children and the children's children. And so the flip side of not forgetting is remembering. And this is very, very important. They're to focus their mind to recall and rehearse what God had done what God had spoken to them uh, in their own life, to, to keep that before them. And it's important, remembering is more than just every once in a while doing a mental recall exercise. Probably the most famous command, the, the, the word remember is used all over the Old Testament. It's a command that's repeated over and over and over again. But probably the most famous one is in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day, how? By keeping it holy. So God is not commanding them, hey, every seven days, I want you just to think and remember that on the seventh day God rested. He's actually saying, no, here's how you remember you're going to act like I did. You are not going to do certain things, and you are going to do other things. That is what it means to remember. So it's not just thinking about it. It's something that prompts concrete actions in our life. God commands us to remember, to focus, meditate, think about, and then act in light of all of that, what he has spoken and what he has done in the lives of his people and in our own life in the past. God is saying you've got to keep that before yourself. The New Testament refers to this as guarding the deposit. And there's a bunch of places that it does this. One of them is in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is speaking to his son, not his biological son, but the next generation, his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says this, Timothy, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now, Paul, the apostle, is speaking to Timothy, who's on his apostolic team. Clearly, this has application to leaders. This is something that I, as an elder in the church, have to read and say, okay, I was given a deposit of the faith that I am to guard and carefully try and pass on. That is application to me. But it actually has application and implication for all believers, all believers are called to focus their mind, recall, rehearse what God had done, and their experience of him and his work in their lives. And notice Paul says, you've got to do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because again, this isn't just rote actions. It's not just some dry duty. Rather, he's saying, the Holy Spirit in you is going to keep stirring these things up, and you are to protect this. You are to keep this. You are to guard the deposit of the faith. Watch over the state of your soul. Keep your passion for Jesus at a white, hot flame, that's how the faith is passed from one generation to the next. So this is all the first part, and it is imperative for you and me. What is not actively recalled, recounted, and rehearsed in our mind, reminding ourselves day after day, is in danger of slipping from my heart and mind. And this is why God tells us, meditate on my word, how often? Day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. God says we have to do this. And if you read in the Psalms, he'll, t he'll recount all the works that he's done. So it's not just his word, not just his commands, but actually the things that God has done. And it's imperative for you and me. If your walk with Jesus, if, if your passion for Jesus is at a low ebb, you have to start there. And the first thing to do is start reminding ourselves of what God has said and what God has done 
in our lives. And then to see that stirred up. Now the second stage that Moses then gives us is we are to pass it on. We're doing this with a view to not only having a walk with ourselves with God, but to pass it on to the next generation. So notice verse 9. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Because, see, it doesn't matter if they've got a close, faithful walk with Yahweh, sitting there in the wilderness about to go into the promised land, but they don't pass it down to their children, then what happens a generation later? It's gone. It's gone. So Moses says, you have to pass this down. And in fact, notice that it's not just one generation, it's your children and your children's children. And this is actually, I have to say, the natural outgrowth of guarding ourselves, remembering and experiencing God in our own lives. Okay? If you are passionate about something, people around you will catch that. And it's true of virtually anything in life. If you find somebody who's passionate about good food or they're passionate about a certain kind of music or they're passionate about their sports team, it's kind of contagious. And other people know they are passionate about that thing. If, if somebody doesn't know something and you say it's really important to you but they don't have any clue about that, then I would question, is it really, really important? And that's true of the faith. If others are not seeing that, I mean, the, the first step is I have to go back and say, where, where's the state of my soul? Where is my own passion level? Am I passionate about the, the gospel and what God has done in my life? Now, this idea of the passion leading me to pass on to the next generation runs throughout Scripture. For example, Abraham, who we're going to jump into Abraham's life next week in our series on God's covenant, but God speaks uh, regarding Abraham in Genesis 18, 19, and the Lord says, For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So God, by chapter 18, God has already made and reinitiated covenant with Abram on three different occasions. Okay, this is a long way into Abram's walk with God. But God is saying, look, I've made all these covenant promises, but how this is going to come to pass is Abraham is not going to just do it himself. He's going to command it in his household. He's going to lead the next generation in doing the same thing. Deuteronomy chapter 6, a verse we use whenever we do baby dedications around here, the, what's known as the Shema. Uh, the, you know, the greatest command to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in verse 6, we're told, The commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So central to the Abrahamic covenant and to the Mosaic covenant, central to what Jesus referred to as the greatest command, is that we are taking it and we are passing it on to the next generation. If you move to the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, uh, particularly the book of Proverbs, the entire book of Proverbs is, my son, listen to this. I want you to learn from me. The things God has done in my life, I am now going to teach to you. I'm going to pass this on to you. And we can follow through all the way down to Paul telling Timothy, you know, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, pass on to others so they can teach others, so they can teach others. We see this over and over again in the Scripture. We also see that if someone fails to do this, there are massive problems. Massive problems. In the book of Judges, this is the generation that, that had been spoken of. It begins with the generation that Moses is actually speaking to in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And here's what happens with them and the generations coming up. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. And actually, you can read from verse 10 to 19 in chapter 2, and you've got the whole message of the book of Judges right there in those nine verses. Generation grows up. 
They experience God. They experience God's word. They experience the work of God. They neglect to tell the next generation. The next generation does not have an experience of God. The next generation even forgets what God had done for their parents. They end up forsaking God. They turn to other gods because we are worshipers. If we are not worshiping the one true God, we will be worshiping someone or something else. So they turn to other gods and then troubles come. And then they cry out to God. He sends a judge who delivers them. They experience the word and the work of God, and then they don't pass it on to the next generation. And it's an almost 400-year cycle of this. Over and over and over again, they run into this. And so this ultimately ends up leading to captivity and trouble. And this cycle has actually been repeated down through the ages many times, not just with Israel. We see it throughout Israel's history, but also in the New Testament and even in the time of the church. So how do we do this command, this call that we're to do? There are several implications that come out of the command. First, the responsibility falls primarily on parents. Okay, I've said this many, many times, but it's true. It is not the church's responsibility to pass the faith on to your children. It is your responsibility. It was not the church's to do it for my children. It was mine. And I'm actually grateful that I had all four of my kids before I was ever an elder in the church because I could say with all, I was doing all this long before I became a pastor in church. From the second I found out Linda was pregnant, I started reading the scripture to the children in the womb started speaking God's word over them and his blessing over them because it falls primarily to parents. Notice, remember back in the Shema, you know, take these commands and impress them on your children. Talk about it when you're sitting at home, when you're walking along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Who's the only people that are there with the kids all those times to do that? It's the parents. It's not, you know, pastor, elders, youth group leader. None of them are there with them. When they're doing those things, parents are. And there are many, many, many studies that back this up. The most important factor in the next generation following Jesus is not how cool the youth group is. It's just simply not. The coolest youth groups in town, the ones that get all the press, have a disastrous rate of passing the faith on. Absolutely awful rate of doing that. Does that mean we shouldn't have youth group? No, we absolutely should. It means youth group is wildly insufficient because it's not God's design. Okay, I can't simply say, well, look, I'm going to make sure somebody else takes care of Linda. What's God's response to that? No, you're her husband. You take care of her. It's your responsibility. You may not delegate that. Friends, you can't delegate it either. And specifically, let me say, if you read in Ephesians 6, we won't take time to turn there, Fathers are specifically given this. You can't even just tell, well, I let my wife do the spiritual stuff. I'm out earning the bacon. Then you're not doing. You're being directly disobedient to God is what you're doing. It is first and foremost the parent's responsibility to do this. And if we do not consistently display an active passionate walk with Jesus, if we are not leading our kids in the word and in prayer and doing that at home regularly, day after day after day, we are basically asking that they won't catch the faith. I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. I think I'm being very clear here, right? It is the number one issue. The church can help. The church must help. We take it very seriously, but the number one thing is what goes on in the home, and no amount of the church will make up for that. Secondly, there's even actually supposed to be extended family, grandparents, and this is something because 
I'm in this phase now. Notice it says, teach them to your children and to their children after them. So the people hearing this are looking not only at their kids, they're down to the third generation. Grandparents are called to help pass the faith down to their grandchildren. Uh, in our After Hours video that will pop out on Tuesday, I actually go through some very practical things of resources and stuff that I've used throughout my life in trying to raise kids in the faith and even now grandkids. And Stephanie and I were laughing the other day because one of the things I had is the little children's Bible that we use that I read to the grandchildren, and that, that sucker's falling apart. It, it, is, it, it has been through the, the, some rough times. That's the sign of a good children's Bible. It should be falling apart. It should be used. And grandparents, we ought to be doing that. It's not just, I love uh, and enjoy getting to be a grandparent. I love that when they do something wrong, mama and daddy can take care of that. Papa's just here to be papa, okay? But, but, when it comes to raising the faith, that there is nothing like teaching them how to read the word of God talking to them about who Jesus is, letting them know the gospel, and being there to support the family. It is, uh, we're called to do it with as many generations as we can. It's great to me that, that my parents are still alive, so there's actually great-grandparents trying to pass the faith on. So our later years are not a return to playtime. That's just not what they are. I'll sell a million copies of a book on this. It's a return to a call to use the new freedoms we have to help our children in raising the next generation in the faith. Now, certainly I enjoy that I have less responsibilities, family responsibilities, than I had, you know, 15 years ago when we were in the teeth of, you know, four teenagers at once, okay? Nice not having all of those responsibilities. But my life's not about playtime. My life is saying, I want to see my grandchildren walking with Jesus. That's my goal and my desire. Thirdly, there's not only family, you know, the parents and the grandparents. There's the broader church community. I mentioned a couple of minutes ago Paul's words to Timothy. Paul says, you then my son. Now, again, there's no blood relationship between Paul and Timothy. But notice Paul saying, these things like you read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Timothy, they apply in the church. I may not have biological children, but I am concerned about the next generation in the church. And so, Timothy, you are my son. And I'm not going to dwell on but notice it begins with, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Timothy, you cannot do what I am talking about if you yourself aren't first built up in grace. If you aren't enjoying the means of grace. If you aren't walking with God every day, you'll never be able to do what I'm talking about because it'll be duty rather than delight. And what does he want him to do? The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, so that's Paul and Timothy, I want you to entrust to reliable men, that's a third generation, who will also be qualified to teach others. Fourth generation. Over and over, the scripture is concerned not even just about the next generation, it is generations down the line that God is worried about and doing. The church is a spiritual family. The church must always work to ensure the faith is passionately embraced by the next generation. If a local church does not do this, it will eventually wither and die. And I want to say we have, we have a blessing. Actually, the other day, something popped up on my phone. I saw a photo, and it was when Don and Myrtle were, were up here being recognized for 50 years of serving this congregation. 50 years. There are a lot of churches do not make it 50 years. There are a lot of churches that are passionate for the gospel in one generation and by the next generation that is dimmed and by the third generation they have nothing to do with what God actually says. That They've lost the word of God. They've lost the gospel. We are only as good as how much we are laboring to pass it on to the next generation. And so this means because Paul's not married, and Timothy's not married. Neither one of them have biological children, and yet they're concerned we got a four-generation thing going on here. And that's because everyone in the church, whether or not they're married or have children, are called to help pass the faith on to the next generation. 
Your concern and mine needs to be not will I die with more toys than my neighbor, but will have I have prayed and labored so that when I am gone and the dew lies cold upon my brow, the faith of Jesus Christ is still active and moving and growing in the local church that I was called to be part of. That needs to be our passion and our desire for all of us. And I again remind us that implication that kind of goes back to the first point, that what is being passed on here that we're talking about is not just knowledge, but a living, vital relationship with Jesus. Notice what what Moses says here is, the things your eyes have seen. Don't, Don't lose what your eyes have seen. Don't let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Moses is saying, this isn't something you just heard about. You experienced this yourself. Remember this, that's what you are passing on. You and I are not talking about a, a, and trying to pass on a set of philosophical beliefs, but rather a personal, vital experience of God's word and work that's happened in our life, and we want to see it happen in the next generation. Okay? Not about a philosophy, not about political things. It is about a living, vital relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're not just trying to get them to say, well, I kind of give assent to certain propositions. We certainly want them to give assent to correct propositions. We, we do want them to embrace that which is true versus that which is error. But we are called to pray and work so that they experience a living, vital relationship with Jesus. Now, Psalm 78 talks about this, and it looks back to this Uh, to, to the earlier days in Israel's history. And here's what Psalm 78 says. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which is the time we're reading about in Deuteronomy 4, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children, that's two generations, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, which is a third generation, and they in turn would tell their children, once again, a fourth generation generation and why then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds but keep his commands notice the goal is an active living trust faith not just that they can parrot certain words but that they have an actual relationship with Jesus and we cannot settle for anything less than a true response of faith and obedience in the next generation. That's what's got to hold our hearts and we need to be crying out to God for. Now, how do we apply this? And we're going to be closing with prayer. The question we have is, am I, how am I helping pass the faith on to the next generation? And the actual question should be not am I, but how am I? Because if, if I ask it, am I, then that implies I could say, well, I'm not, but that's not my call. But if you're sitting here, that's not true. How am I helping pass the faith on to the next generation? God's always on mission to the next generation. Are we going to be there with him? He calls every believer to have this multi-generational perspective, to be engaged on this multi-generational mission. So looking back at the things that he communicates to us in Deuteronomy 4, 9, am I watching over my own soul carefully, maintaining a vibrant, growing walk with Jesus? Because if I am not, that does not just have implications for me. It has implications for those around me. If I, as a leader in this church, am not doing it, it will affect the temperature, so to speak, of the congregation. If we do not have it in our families, it will affect the next generation. If we don't have it in the congregation, it will affect the next generation. So, is my soul aflame with love and passion for Jesus, or does my practice of faith seem more like a hobby And my involvement in the church seemed more like a club. Because see, here's what happens. If my 
faith is not passionate and it looks like a hobby. And my involvement in the church seems more like a club. Guess what the next generation grows up and says? Well, that's good. I got my own hobby. Dad's got his. The church has theirs, whatever. They've got their club. I do something different with my time. That's what happens if it's not a passion. If it's just kind of like a little hobby, if it's a, if it's a duty that I'm going through. So is my soul aflame with passion with Jesus, no matter how long you've been walking with him? If I were to, you know, we just went through a, a week or two ago where every year, you know, the president stands up and he gives that address in Congress. And what's it called? The State of the Union. I want you to ask yourself a question. If you had to stand up and televise your state of the soul address. This is the state of my soul. What does it look like? Thankfully, we don't, we're not all going to stand up here and do that. But, and, and let me be clear. Is, is the answer to that question always, I love Jesus more passionately than I did yesterday? No. And it's not for me. There are times I feel very close and times where it's ebbing, but that's why I've got to keep remembering. I've got to keep calling to mind. I've got to keep asking myself. So what would that look like? Secondly, am I passing the faith on to my own children? If you are a parent here, or even a grandparent, I'd say, do I pray for my children to know, trust, and love God supremely? This, this should consume your prayer life. You, you are going to have, from the time they are young all the way to they're grown, okay, it should consume your prayer life. I, I used to tell Jesus, and I meant this, and he's tested me on this, I, I don't care if you send them off to the far corners of the earth as a missionary. I don't care what, what other call they got on. All I want is them to know and love and serve you. That is all that matters to me. Everything else is just icing on the cake. Is that our heart's cry for our children? Or am I more concerned that they get into the right school? That they get the right job? Because if that's the deepest concern, I have a problem in my soul. If the deepest concern is that they experience the American dream, I have a problem in my soul. Jesus did not die for the American dream. Okay? So do we understand that? Do I do devotions with my children? And I mean regularly, not once in a blue moon. Do I read to them day after day after day after day? If you are a parent and you still got kids at home, I encourage you to watch After Hours on Tuesday. You can see just a whole bunch of things that we did with ours and tools that I recommend. And here's the good news. There are way better things out there to help you do it now than there were 20 years ago when I was trying to figure out things to do. There, I wish we'd had the Jesus Storybook Bible that I read to my grandchildren. That thing is just awesome. And they didn't have a lot of that 20 years ago. So, but it, however I'm doing it, am I doing that to raise up my children in the faith? Do I look for divine appointments every day? Remember in, in the Shema there, it says when you're walking along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, it's just saying wherever you are in life, do I look for those moments where all of a sudden the kid opens up about something or there is this moment? I'm not talking about, you know, you're trying to drag Jesus into every conversation in a weird way. I'm saying, am I, am I open? Am I paying attention to what's going on in their soul and asking God, give me opportunities to talk to them about this? In short, are they catching a passion for Jesus and his mission from me? Or does it appear that this is more like a hobby? And then the last question, am I passing the faith on to the next generation here at BRCC? Every single person is part of this task. Everybody. If you never get married, never have kids, you're still part of seeing the faith go to the next generation. We're called to pray we're called to labor together to see that happen. 
Am I aware of that? Am I taking my place for doing it? Do I regularly pray for the next generation? Do, do I regularly cry out for, for the little ones that are running around? Okay, and we got a lot of them here. Or do I just say it's really cute when they come up and they sing every few weeks? Am I praying for them to get the faith? How can I help BRCC in discipling the next generation? Okay, it's a massive task that we can easily forget. There is a lot going on up there right now. It requires a lot of people to be training the next generation. And I want to encourage you. You may sit there and say, well, I'm not doing it because working with kids is not my gift. Well, I have good news for you. It's not a matter of gifting. It's a matter of service. It really doesn't matter whether it's my gift or not. It's, it's a call that God gives to us, and we serve with one another. You know, I wouldn't know how to teach. Well, good news is you don't have to. We, we have curriculum. You're not asked to open the Bible and figure out, out of 1,167 chapters, which one to teach on this week. There's stuff that's there for you. I can't always make it to the meeting. Neither do I, and still I'm standing up here preaching right now. We can easily all be engaged and involved, and we need to be engaged and involved. And so I want to throw out a personal challenge. Have you prayed and sought God about being involved? And the default ought to be that I'm going to be involved, not that I'm not going to be involved unless, you know, see, it's, it's easy. We like to put fleeces out, you know, but we like to put fleeces out that make it where it's going to take something like just short of the resurrection to get God to show me to do that which I don't want to do. That's a backwards way of doing things. Fleeces are a bad idea anyway. But as you're seeking God, is my default, how can I be engaged and help? How can I be part of doing this? I want to encourage and challenge you. This is essential. And I want to go back and remind you what I said at first. There is so much joy. It is, it is huge to me when I stand up. You know, one of the last baptisms we had last year when, well, both last year, I mean, I, I was involved in baptizing some of my own grandkids, Ronnie and Renee's kids, Duke and Meg and their daughters. And I remember, obviously, raising my own children and seeing them water baptized. I remember Renee when she was really young. Ronnie's older than I am, so I can't say that about him. Right, Ronnie? I remember them when they were just starting out dating and then seeing their kids do it. I remember when Duke was just coming to faith and we were meeting every week at a Denny's, wasn't it? And we were sitting there and I was trying to disciple and help him grow in the faith. And then to watch their children. There is a joy when you are invested in it that is just beyond. Our culture throws that away. We throw that away. Don't. Let's be invested because when you watch God working from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, there is a depth and a richness of joy that comes from that that you're not going to find anywhere else. And that's what God wants to give to us. So we're going to stand and close in prayer. I encourage you to stand with me and let's cry out to God together for ourselves and for the coming generation. Hallelujah. Lord, you are the everlasting God. Father, we, we began by singing that this morning. And Lord, we know it is true from your word. Uh, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. But when there was nothing here, you spoke and created everything. You are the God of eternity. And Lord, you have called human beings to walk with you, and you have been working with us from the dawn of time. Lord, we are here because there have been men and women who were faithful to you and your call in times past. And so the faith has been passed from one generation to the next. Lord, today is our time. 
And Lord, we want to be faithful. We do not want to be ones who would drop the baton. We do not want to be ones who would be the weak link in the chain. Father, we don't pray this and say this out of some sense of guilt or fear. Lord, it's out of a recognition that you are the God of generations. You have worked across all this time. You have been faithful to us. And Lord, out of gratitude, we want to see the faith live on. Jesus, I don't know when you're going to return, but I know that you have promised the faith will still be here. And I want to be found as long as I am here being part of seeing it go to the next generation. Lord, I pray for every one of us. I pray for the parents who are here, who are engaged day by day. Father, there are many, many joys in being a parent. There are also times of challenge. I pray for the moms and dads who are in the midst of that. Father, I pray that you would be stirring up your word and your spirit and your work in their soul. I pray where there is tiredness that you would renew strength. I pray where there is discouragement that you would give a spirit of hope and encouragement. I pray where there is just confusion and not sure what's going on that you would give a spirit of wisdom and love and power and a sound mind to know what to do. Father, I pray for all of us, whether we have children or not, that we would be aflame with the passion to see your work go forth, not just in our own life, not just in this local congregation, not even just in our own day, but that you would spread out from here to the farthest corners of the earth, and you would spread from here until the day that Jesus returns, from one generation to the next to the next. Lord, you are worthy of all the praise that could be given to you. Lord, you are our creator. You are our redeemer. You are our sustainer. And so, Lord, as Paul told Timothy to guard the deposit with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit who is within him, we commit ourselves to you. I pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit upon each of us and upon this congregation as a whole. Lord, we want to be faithful. And Father, I pray that if Jesus should tarry and a hundred years from now, whatever else is going on in the world at the time, whatever has happened in our country, whatever is going on in Annapolis, Lord, I pray that Bay Ridge Christian Church would be a faithful outpost of your gospel. That people could come and they could hear and they could taste and they could see that the Lord is good. Father, would you hear our prayer and would you do all of this in Jesus' name for your glory and our good. Amen. Now may the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Go forth blessed and be a blessing in this generation and the next. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.